Hello, my name is Dr. Allison Hodacek and I'm a third year resident in the University of Wisconsin Family Medicine Residency Program in Madison, Wisconsin. Today we are going to be discussing an approach to acute GI bleeds. As a family physician, you will encounter GI bleeding in your inpatient and outpatient practices. Our focus today will be on the acute, life-threatening GI bleeds that you see in the hospital and ICU settings. A patient with an acute, significant GI bleed will present with hematemesis or hematochesia. In an acute upper GI bleed, the patient may complain of bright red blood in emesis or coffee ground emesis. They may also complain of dark tarry stools. In an acute lower GI bleed, the principal complaint will be hematochesia, usually bright red blood per rectum. Rarely, a very rapid upper GI bleed can also cause bright red bloody stools due to rapid transit through the intestines. Patients may complain of symptoms associated with rapid blood loss, including dizziness and palpitations. Some patients, particularly the elderly or those with coronary artery disease, may develop symptoms from the acute anemia. This can include angina and shortness of breath. As you can see from this table, the differential diagnosis of upper and lower GI bleeding can be broad, so obtaining a past medical history can help you narrow your search. For an upper GI bleed, if the patient has a history of cirrhosis or end-stage liver disease, esophageal variceal bleeding must be strongly considered. If the patient reports recent use of NSAIDs or prednisone, they are at risk of having a bleeding peptic ulcer. A history of vomiting might suggest a Mallory Weiss tear. Regular alcohol abuse can predispose a patient to erosive esophagitis or gastritis. A history of an aortic aneurysm repair raises the possibility of aortoenteric fistula. Recent abdominal pain might suggest an ulcer. Recent use of aspirin or anticoagulants increases the risk of bleeding from any potential source in the GI tract. In a lower GI bleed, if a patient has a known history of diverticulosis, hemorrhoids, or inflammatory bowel disease, that can narrow your search. A history of recent weight loss or a family history of colon cancer could suggest malignancy. A patient with known severe vascular disease will be at increased risk of ischemic colitis. Similarly, the initial physical evaluation should serve to help you narrow your differential and also assess the patient's clinical stability. Vital signs should be noted and any patient with tachycardia or hypotension should be presumed to be unstable. An abdominal exam should be performed to assess for pain and rebound tenderness. Patients with peritoneal signs should be assessed for perforation with an upright abdominal film. If a history of alcohol abuse is obtained, the patient should be assessed for stigmata of liver disease. Any patient with acute ongoing blood loss or evidence of hemodynamic instability, such as shock or orthostatic hypotension, should be admitted to an ICU for further care. In general, upper GI bleeds tend to have higher rates of mortality and acute hemodynamic instability than lower GI bleeds. When it comes to acute management, like any other ill patient, we have to think about the ABCs first. Ensure the patient is protecting their airway and breathing adequately. Patients with ongoing hematemesis may be at risk of aspirating or losing their airway, particularly in the setting of altered mental status, which may result from acute blood loss. Sometimes elective intubation is pursued. The patient should be kept MPO. Supplemental oxygen by nasal cannula should be applied to maximize oxygen delivery in the setting of acute anemia. To address circulation, the patient should have two large bore IVs placed and they should receive IV crystalloids such as normal saline. Typically, the patient receives 500 to 1,000 milliliter boluses of fluid at a time, and the clinical response is monitored. Initial labs should include a CBC, type and cross, complete metabolic profile, and a PT and PTT. Keep in mind that in the setting of an acute bleed, hemoglobin may be normal. Recall that it can take up to 24 hours for a hemoglobin level to equalize after an acute blood loss. The acute anemia seen is usually normocytic. If the patient has a microcytic anemia suggesting iron deficiency, they have possibly had a chronic bleed for some time. In an upper GI bleed, blood is absorbed in the small intestine, which elevates the BUN. So an elevated BUN in this setting may suggest an upper GI bleed, though hypovolemia can cause an elevation in BUN as well. Elevated transaminases may suggest liver disease, 
EKG and troponins may be indicated for elderly patients, patients with a history of coronary artery disease, or those with symptoms of cardiac ischemia. There is some debate as to whether placing an NG tube and performing gastric lavage is indicated in these settings. Sometimes the source of bleeding is not entirely clear, or we maybe suspect a lower GI bleed, but want to rule out an upper bleed before proceeding with colonoscopy. In these settings, sometimes gastric lavage with an NG tube is performed. If there is blood in the aspirate, then there is an upper GI source. There is also some thought that performing lavage before upper endoscopy may improve visibility for the endoscopist. That being said, this is not routine standard of care for all patients. For patients with severe acute blood loss, blood transfusion must certainly be considered. The decision is based on the patient, their comorbidities, and their rate of bleeding. Most would agree that we should transfuse for a hemoglobin less than seven grams per deciliter, but if a patient is having symptoms related to anemia, transfusion is indicated even if the hemoglobin is higher. Some argue that patients with coronary artery disease should be transfused to maintain a hemoglobin of 10 or greater to maximize coronary oxygen delivery. If a patient has thrombocytopenia, platelets can be transfused, and if a patient has been on warfarin and has an elevated INR, fresh frozen plasma may be administered. While following these patients, labs such as hemoglobin, platelet counts, and INR are often checked every two to six hours depending on the patient's clinical stability. In regards to medical therapies, for an acute upper GI bleed, it is recommended that all patients receive an IV proton pump inhibitor. For patients who wind up having a bleeding ulcer, administration of a high-dose PPI has been shown to reduce the rate of rebleeding and reduce the duration of hospital stay. Even in patients who are bleeding from sources other than ulcers, it is thought that neutralization of the stomach acid helps stabilize blood clots, which promotes hemostasis. The PPI should be given as a bolus followed by a continuous infusion. If the patient was indeed found to have an ulcer, they should be sent home on an oral PPI on discharge. There are a couple additional medication considerations for patients with cirrhosis or end-stage liver disease. If the patient is suspected to be bleeding from esophageal varices, IV octreotide should be initiated. This is administered as an IV bolus followed by a continuous infusion. Additionally, patients with cirrhosis who are hospitalized for an upper GI bleed have a 50% risk of acquiring an infection while hospitalized. Studies have demonstrated that if empiric antibiotics are initiated on these patients, there is a reduction in infectious complications and possibly decreased mortality. Recommendations on local practices vary, but frequently used antibiotics include fluoroquinolones and ceftriaxone. Finally, after the patient has been acutely stabilized, the ultimate goal is to find the source of bleeding. The diagnostic tool for an acute upper GI bleed is an EGD, which can be both diagnostic and therapeutic. Ulcers can be cauterized and varices banded. Biopsies may be taken to assess for the presence of H. pylori. For lower GI bleeds, colonoscopy is the test of choice for diagnosis. Like upper endoscopy, it can provide therapeutic benefit as well, actively bleeding lesions may be cauterized. Unfortunately, acute colonoscopy can be challenging as the patient has not had a prior bowel prep, and this can lead to inadequate visualization. If the patient has clinically stabilized following resuscitation, many providers elect to perform the procedure non-emergently later in the hospital stay when an adequate prep can be performed. Arteriography is another diagnostic option for localizing the source of a lower GI bleed. However, while it is a highly specific test, its sensitivity is much lower than colonoscopy. Thus, arteriography is not recommended as a first-line study, but rather as an option for patients that cannot undergo colonoscopy or if colonoscopy is non-diagnostic. In summary, the initial approach to a patient with an acute GI bleed includes managing the ABCs and obtaining pertinent history, exam, and laboratory studies to discern the etiology and evaluate the extent of the bleed. The decision to transfuse blood should be based on the individual patient scenario. Medications such as IV proton pump inhibitors and IV octreotide are indicated in certain situations. Finally, endoscopy is the ultimate diagnostic tool in this setting and may provide therapeutic benefit as well.